Welcome to U.S. Law Shield webinar live across America. In Houston, Texas, I'm Sam Malone, proud, proud member of U.S. Law Shield. Been a member, there you go, got it in there? Right there, baby, wear it proud. Been a member for a bunch of years. If you're not, come join the family. U.S. Law Shield family, up to about 525,000 members across America. Why? Because U.S. Law Shield is legal defense for self-defense. You defend your life, they'll defend your freedom. They're known for that attorney answered emergency hotline 24-7, answered by an independent program attorney in your state. They're the leading legal defense for self-defense program in America. Come and join uslawshield.com. uslawshield.com. Why join? Because the stability continues to unravel in our society. We're seeing examples of mostly well-meaning gun owners making uninformed, rash decisions that have grave consequences, not just in the court of public opinion, but in real court. So tonight, we're going to look at some of these instances like the famous McCluskey trespass St. Louis story and others. We'll break them down so that you will find out what you need to know. This way, you can stay on the right side of the law if the unthinkable should happen to you. We'll get to that. Plus, of course, we'll hear from Dr. Hamasfar about tips for staying nice and healthy. Essential. So important in these tumultuous times with COVID-19. Then, fan favorite segment, Q&A with Emily Taylor, Richard Hayes, both independent program attorneys right here in the great state of Texas. We take your questions and they answer them. Let's get started. Independent program attorney, great friend Edwin Walker from the great state of Texas and from Louisiana, independent program attorney James Reeves. Edwin, good to have you. Well, thank you, Sam. It's always great to join you on one of these uh, live uh, webinars. All right, James, you ready to rock and roll from Cajun land? Always, always, Sam. Thanks for having me in the program. This is only my second time. I'm going to give this to him. I'm still a rookie. Be You're easy on me. You're a rock star. Here we go. Um, let's start with the obvious one, the one I talked about at the open. The McCluskey couple in Missouri, they were confronted by protesters on their property with guns. Edwin as we're looking at the B-roll and the pictures of the story, can you walk us through the good, the bad, and the ugly of this situation? Well, clearly the McCloskeys um, were taken by surprise with regard to this protest. And, um, you know, seeing what has been transpiring on the news for the last couple of months, I think it had been about a month whenever this incident actually occurred, uh, they were concerned with whether or not their property might fall victim to some of these uh, protesters turning into rioters. And of course, that's what we all worry about. And uh, so, you know, they took to their own property uh, with their own firearms. I think this may have been exacerbated by the fact that they assumed that they uh, that not only their property was private, but the street on which their property was on was also private. So you can imagine the surprise uh, that presented uh, that was presented to them whenever they found all these protesters that had not only broken down the gate, but of course were then uh, marching up and down the private street uh, and also entering their private property. Now, of course, being that these are highly politically charged times, uh, it was only a matter of time before uh, the uh, uh, the mob came after them. Uh, the of course the the, the uh, prosecutors in that area got involved and they were eventually charged. Uh, now, the interesting thing is, looking at it legally, they were charged with violating um, Missouri statutes regarding the unlawful use of weapons. Uh, specifically, what they were charged with was uh, that they ex exhibited in the presence of one or more persons a weapon readily capable of lethal use in an angry or threatening manner. And I think that's the that's the curious part. They weren't charged with assaulting any specific individual. They weren't charged with uh, threatening any specific individual. Uh, what they were charged with was this broad catch-all that Missouri has that most states have. In fact, here in Texas, we actually have two of them. We have one called disorderly conduct. We have one called deadly conduct. 
And um, it'll be very interesting to see how this plays out because I believe that this, uh, this, this statute probably you know, may not meet constitutional muster. And that appears to be very vague and very, very overbroad. Uh, additionally, Missouri also has a very, um, has a very, very well-written necessity defense. So they can claim not only defense of themselves, they can say that they felt threatened, they can claim defense of property, they can say that their property was threatened, and uh, they can also use the defense of necessity. And keep in mind that they did not shoot the firearm. And in many states, Texas included, it does make a difference whether you show the firearm versus shooting the firearm. For example, here in Texas, um, showing a firearm is simply a use of force, whereas shooting a firearm is a use of deadly force. And I believe that Missouri laws are very, very similar in that regard. And so it's going to be an interesting case. Um, I kind of would like to see, uh, from a legal perspective, I'd like to see the politics taken out of it. And so um, I know that the Missouri Attorney General has said that he wants to get involved and he doesn't want to see the McCluskey's charge. Um, I would like to see how this plays out legally because, of course, how it plays out will provide an example for people to use in the future about how to gauge their own activity, whether or not their own uh, right, you know, right. brandishing of the weapon will be viewed as being reasonable in the future. Edwin Walker, independent program attorney, U.S. Law Shield. He's in Texas. James, for the national perspective, for a good guy gun owner, and you're an independent program attorney in Louisiana, what can a good guy gun owner take away from this? Well, I think you have to look at reasonable fear and reasonable response. In most states, that's self-defense as legal defense. That's what it turns on, whether or not your fear was reasonable and whether or not your response was reasonable. So the question here, what you really need to look at as a gun owner, if you're interested in protecting your property, you need to ask yourself, uh, do I have a reasonable fear if somebody is, say, running down my street or if you have protesters walking in front of your house? Does that uh, am I in reasonable fear or would it be perceived that I would have a reasonable fear? And would it be a reasonable response for me to grab my AR, my shotgun, my pistol, whatever, and then run out in my yard and start pointing it at people? So that's the thing. And I'm not saying one way or the other. I'm saying that if you're going to raise legal defense as a self-defense, uh, I'm sorry, self-defense as legal defense, that's the question that's going to come up. Um whether or not you're standing on the curtilage of your property with a firearm pointing at a people who may or may not have violated your property rights. Is that something that uh, is, does that rise to the level of, of committing a crime? Is that not legal self-defense? I think we're going to find out. But if you ask me, I think this is a really salacious case, given the, the context of the times that we're in. It's uh, very attractive from a media perspective, to say the least. Um, and so it's, it's necessarily attracting a lot of attention, but I, I think it's going to be a glorified property case. You know, this is, they're in a private neighborhood, they're on the curtilage of their property. Uh, where does their property begin? Where does it end? I think it's really going to turn on that. Let me get back to uh, Edwin Walker, independent program attorney. You know, the irony, Mr. Walker, of they came out to defend themselves, I guess, with their guns, but then the DA comes and takes the guns away, I guess it kind of leaves them defenseless, Mr. Walker. Well, you have to remember that any time a gun is involved in, a, in an alleged crime, uh, the gun is a piece of evidence. And of course, it is going to be confiscated. Now, with regard to whether or not that gives the state the right to confiscate the rest of your guns, I think that's where you can, uh, you know, that's where people should become aware exactly what the laws of, the, of their state are. Uh, certainly, if it's a state with red flag protective orders, uh, certainly red flag protective orders give the, the right of the state to come in and take all of your guns. Uh, the, uh, um, <clears throat> if there's a, a bond condition or a standing bond order or there, there's a law in the state that says that anytime somebody's charged with a gun crime, they not only lose the right to that specific gun, uh, they lose the right to all their guns. And so it's it's good to know what the laws are. And, of course, if you find those laws to be reprehensible, uh, to change them. 
Uh, but just as a general, you know, as, just as a general term, and I think this is going to apply in every single state, if you're charged with a gun crime, that gun becomes the key piece of evidence that the state will uh, use. And of course, it will be uh, it will be taken and tagged as evidence. So it will not be in your possession until the case is resolved. Absolutely. I'm Sam Malone. You're watching U.S. Law Shield webinar live. The topic, how to avoid becoming a headline during this national crisis. If you're not a member yet, go online, uslawshield.com. Join over 525,000 other members who have access to that emergency attorney answered hotline 24-7, answered by an independent program attorney in your state. Uh, James Reeves, independent program attorney in Louisiana. Let's go to another story that became a national headline called the Chipotle incident. Chipotle is a restaurant. James, give us a quick recap of what happened. Why couldn't the best happen at a Burger King? That's what I want to know. I love Chipotle. I hate that it had to happen here. Now it's associated with this incident. You have a, a white couple leaving a, the restaurant and they bump into an African-American family. And actually, uh, what I've heard, my understanding is there was some physical contact, accidental physical contact. Uh, you have the African-American family saying, hey, look, we would like an apology uh, for you bumping into us. And then you've got this white couple saying, uh, we, we don't feel like we owe you an apology. And then things escalate from there. At one point, I believe, uh, you had a, a member from the, the family that got bumped into standing behind the car. So uh, the couple couldn't leave the restaurant. And uh, then you have, I believe, the uh, the, the woman. Uh, she gets out of the car. She gets out of the vehicle with her gun and points it uh, at one of the African-American family members. And then, of course, once again, we're talking about an incident, uh, highly charged times, racial tensions at a high and this is, is not necessarily a headline that you want to see anybody, that anybody wants to see, black, white, gun owner, non-gun owner. So that's my understanding of the incident. All right. So with that said, I mean, how do you de-escalate something like this? James, we'll stay with you. James Reeves, independent program attorney. Um, what do we take away from this unfortunate situation? Yeah, you don't need a lawyer to tell you that common sense uh, helps a lot. And here's the thing. I mean, ultimately, I'm not going to say who's right and who's wrong. I think it's silly, or if you have accidental contact, that one party, black, white, whatever, would demand an apology. And then I think it's silly that if there's somebody who's clearly hostile and, and they're upset that, that they got bumped into, that in lieu of saying, hey, I'm sorry, and just being on your way, you're going to escalate to the point reproduce a firearm. Now, there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of interesting questions here uh, that come up down the stream. Like when you're being prevented from leaving, I've had people ask me on the hotline, they've called me and asked me on the hotline, am, am I being, is that kidnapping? If I'm, uh, if I can't leave, I'm trying to leave the, the premises, you have somebody standing behind my car. Uh, but you don't have to get to those questions if you just exercise a little bit of humility and common sense because they got arrested. The white couple uh, was arrested. I'm sure their guns were also uh, confiscated. And are they going to get cleared? Maybe, maybe not. Are they going to plea out? Maybe, maybe not. But it all could have been avoided just by saying, hey, you know what? I'm sorry. Do you have to do that? No. Uh, is it possible that they did nothing wrong at all? Yeah, it's, it's definitely possible they did nothing wrong at all. It's possible that they didn't know an apology. But at what point are you going to let a conflict escalate to where you're going to produce a firearm when it could have been, you could have de-escalated the whole thing right at the outset. So I think really the main takeaway here isn't necessarily a legal one. It's everybody needs to appreciate that right now tensions are at an all-time high. And it might be a good idea to exercise a little bit of restraint. Excellent. Independent program attorney Edwin Walker in Texas. Protests still going on a lot of places. We see in Portland, we saw in Richmond, New York, and others. Sometimes good people get hurt in the process. What advice do you have? Now, you're an independent program attorney in Texas. What do you have kind of advice-wise for a good Samaritan who wants to jump in, get involved, and help someone 
who is clearly getting injured? Well, you know, that's a tough question. As far as the law goes, um, <clears throat> uh, most states uh, allow somebody to use the same, they have the same right of self-defense to use for a third party uh, that they uh, that they do in defending themselves. So if your question is purely from a legal standpoint, will I be able to claim, uh, will I be able to have a defense if I come to the rescue of somebody who I have a reasonable belief, and again, there's that word because that's what all of our self-defense laws are based on, do I have a reasonable belief that the person was in need of protection, that the person need that the other person was using unlawful force against them, possibly unlawful deadly force against them, and that uh, and that I can step into the shoes of that individual and protect them. Uh, the vast majority of states say yes, yes, you can. Now, with regard to is that the best idea? Uh, obviously, everybody has to be governed by their own moral compass. And they have to look out for their own safety and the safety of those around them. And so, um, uh, you know, you, you, you have to make that decision. Unfortunately, you have to judge the circumstances. Uh, there are a lot of things that go into that. Disparity of force. Are there more? How many individuals are actually attacking this individual? Uh, proximity to law enforcement. You know, is, is there a police officer within distance that he can respond immediately or are you out there on an island by yourself or you know you have no uh, help around you and so you know while it is certainly noble to want to believe that we would all come to the rescue of another human being who was in danger of of being killed or maimed uh, I certainly think that 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 hopefully deep down our humanity would want us to do that uh, like I said again you have to make your own moral decision but legally, if you do come to the defense of somebody who is being subjected to unlawful force, uh, you should be on a very firm legal ground as long as uh, the reasonable person, the ordinary person, the reasonable right. person would view those circumstances the same way you do. Now, we're big supporters of police and law enforcement, but James, what if some, your buddy, innocent bystander, starts getting hammered by the cops? And you're thinking, oh, let me jump in. I'm going to save my friend from law enforcement as they hit him with nightsticks or whatever. Independent program attorney from Louisiana. What do you say? Mm. Oh, that's a tough one. Sam, I said, be easy on me. This is only my second time on the program. Look, now, I think Edwin did a fantastic job of explaining it. I'm not sure that the circumstances um, are, are, from a legal perspective, you might have a more difficult time. If you're stepping in to defend another person from a police officer, um, already you can tell Edwin's trying to give the good lawyerly advice of just don't get involved. I mean, even when it's uh, you have somebody who's a third party uh, being attacked by another third party, it really the, the most conservative approach and, and the safest thing is to just not get involved. And I hate saying that because it removes the humanity from the situation. Again, as Edwin says, everybody's got their own moral compass. You don't know how you're going to react. You don't know if you're going to step in. But if, I mean, I'll tell you this, if you're going to step in to try to defend your buddy from, say, law enforcement, it better be very clear cut in your favor. Um, and, and I'm having a hard time thinking of, of, of a circumstance where uh, you aren't also going to take a beating and go to jail. I mean, that's, that's, I would, I would guess just, just a guess. I'm not a psychic, but I think you're going to get a beat down and you're going to get jail time no matter what, even if you ultimately end up being in the right. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just telling you what could happen. Yeah. Well, James Reeves, independent. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Edwin. Yeah. So, and so hopefully somebody has it on video. Oh, they will. They will. You know, at this day and age, they will. It's the truth. Edwin, staying with you, we're seeing a lot more in the past, let's say, four to five months of people brandishing their weapon, drawing their weapon, firing their weapons. We're seeing it way more than we did, let's say, five or six months ago. So I've got to ask, has the justification legally for drawing your weapon or firing weapon, has that changed or does it change during uncertain times? In the times we're in right now, lockdowns, COVID-19, desperation, protests, violence, what do you say? Well, you know, this is one of the unique things about self-defense law is because self-defense law has both an objective component and a subjective component. 
And the thing about it is, is that the law hasn't changed, but circumstances have changed. And people's perception about what is reasonable and not reasonable may have changed. And you're right. We are in unprecedented times right now. Uh, with regard to the whole, you know, the COVID and the uh, quarantines and the lockdowns and the masks and everything else. And then on top of it, uh, we had, of course, the the the, uh, the the racial strife arising from the George Floyd incident. And it has continued. And of course, it has spiraled into something else. It's no longer really just about justice for George Floyd, because all of his police assailants have been charged with murder. So i the wheels of justice are spinning in that, but now it's created an entire social movement uh, that has led to these protests, and of course protests uh, in many ways and many circumstances turning violent. And so I think it has changed people's perception. Now the key is, is that if you are arrested in one of these situations, if you do pull your gun on people who surround your vehicle and start beating it with signs, but yet they don't actually break in and grab a hold of you, but you still pull your gun. Um, but your case is not going to go to trial for another year. And so are people, are members of your jury going to remember what times were like? Is that going to become part of the case? Hey, folks, remember last summer whenever racial tensions were at an all-time high, whenever protests were turning into riots at a, at a moment's notice? Uh, and so that all, all those are circumstances which will play a very, very important part in establishing the, uh, the self-defense argument of anybody who is tried uh, from an incident arising during these times. Which is ideal because the topic of our conversation is how to avoid becoming a headline during this crisis and going on. James, let me jump over to you. Uh, you're in Louisiana. I'm in Texas. The mayor of Houston just instituted a mask law. If you're outside, the police, he thinks, will give you a $250 citation, a warning first. But he thinks the police have nothing better to do, I guess, than to go out and hand out citations for not wearing a mask. Um, if, it's, I don't know, I get arrested for not wearing a mask, right? How does it affect my gun rights? Do the two, are the two even connected, James Reeves? Uh, it, it, this is a state-by-state state issue, and it's one that I've a, a question that I have, and I'm sure Edwin has gotten over and over and over uh, over this period. You know, everybody wants to know, uh, can I carry a gun while I'm wearing a mask? More so than can I carry a gun if I'm not wearing a mask? That's really the question that I get more often than anything is if I'm wearing a mask and I'm concealing my identity in my state, is it illegal for me to carry a gun? Now, whether or not you're committing an infraction, uh, whether or not that makes you all of a sudden now you're illegally carrying a weapon, I don't think that that's the case in, in most, if any, states at all. I mean, Edwin, of course, uh, he, he, feel free to chime in and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you know, that's like, hey, if I'm carrying a gun, but I park in a handicapped parking space illegally, am I now going to go to jail for, for uh, felony illegal carrying of a concealed weapon? It's like, no, they're, they're two disjointed things. What you have to worry about more in most states um, is whether or not you can carry while you're wearing a mask. And uh, those state laws do vary. I know how it is in Texas. I know how it is in Louisiana, Mississippi, the Gulf states. But everywhere else, uh, things could be different. And I think that it's something that we as concealed handgun carriers need to educate ourselves on. Excellent. Edwin, yeah, jump in on that from the Texas point of view. <laughs> and you're in our neck of the woods. You know the mayor just issued a $250 fine that the police could slap you with for not wearing a mask. Um, Texas, would that interfere with my ability to carry a gun, have my gun, my concealed handgun license? Well, yeah, it's just, uh, it's, with regard to, to James' previous answer, I believe there's only one state, Illinois, which absolutely prohibits it. Uh, most states say you can't wear a mask for the purposes of concealing your identity. Uh, and obviously, we're wearing masks for other reasons. And then the majority of states, though, actually are like Texas, where there is no law that ties the two together in any way. So there's no law with regard to wearing a mask, carrying a gun, carrying a gun, wearing a mask. Uh, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no place where those two are joined whatsoever. Now, 
as a license holder here in Texas, if you do get uh, fined or ticketed for wearing a mask, um, it, it shouldn't, it won't affect your license because it's a Class C misdemeanor. Uh, it's not a jailable offense. It's a fine-only offense. Uh, it's a Class C misdemeanor. Class C misdemeanors generally don't affect your license. There's only one type of Class C misdemeanor that will, and that is a, uh, a crime under 4201, which is the disorderly conduct statute. So, uh, so it is kind of interesting because uh, generally, if it's done pursuant to a municipal order, it will be a municipal offense. However, um, under Texas law, Texas does have a very, very odd law that we talked about back in March when this thing first started, uh, which uh, it is part of the uh, is part of the code that these orders can be issued with uh, jail time as a possible penalty attached. And so if you're charged with that offense, if you're charged with a, uh, uh, anything that could possibly send you to jail, uh, that would affect your license because that would be considered a Class B misdemeanor or higher. Uh, so if it's just going to be a fine, just fine only, don't have to worry. And also, if you are concerned about are you committing some sort of weird, odd crime uh, that's different than the mask ordinance because you are also carrying your handgun or any other firearm for that matter, uh, you are, at least here in the state of Texas, you are not, and in most other states in the United States, you are not as well. Amazing. Good stuff. Good stuff. The topic, how to avoid becoming a headline during this crisis. Independent program attorney from Texas, Edwin Walker. Sir, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sam. And from the great state of Louisiana next door, where we all go from Mardi Gras, James Reeves, independent program attorney. Sir. Thank you for joining Thanks us. Thanks for having me, Sam. I you appreciate it as usual. Good job. You'll be back for number three. In the meantime, everybody, can you see how crazy it is out there and why more than ever you need to join us, like myself, proud member, U.S. Law Shield. Go online at any time. Do it now. Do it later tonight. Do it tomorrow. U.S.LawShield.com and become a member. Why? Because they provide you with legal defense for your self-defense. And these tumultuous times, they remind you, you defend your life, they'll defend your freedom. It's abundantly clear. And you know what else? 525,000 plus people have made that decision to become members of U.S. Law Shield. So they get the card to carry with that special hotline number, that attorney answered emergency hotline 24-7, including holidays. Up next, we'll hear from Dr. Rick Hammisfar with great tips about staying healthy. And don't forget fan favorites, our Q&A, where your questions get answered by independent program attorneys Emily Taylor and Richard Hayes, coming up next. The incident you know, reaffirmed my concern that there are you know, evil forces out there at all times. I think he just really was the perfect person for this situation because a lot of people probably would have hesitated or would have been too emotional to do what needed to be done. And it was really clear very quickly on that um, Jack was a hero and what he had done was completely justified. Texas Law Shield is a complete package. There's no stopping point once you're signed up with Law Shield. My name is Jack Wilson, and I'm a proud member of U.S. and Texas Law Shield. Real heroes, real protection. Good evening, there's been a lot of emphasis on mask wear lately, so let's look at the things we need to know about selecting a mask. Because frankly, the wrong mask will allow the virus to spread. And let's face it, if we're gonna wear a mask, we wanna be sure to wear one that will work, that will protect us and the people around us. So how do we go about selecting the proper mask? 
Well, there are a couple of points you need to be aware of. First of all, you absolutely must use a mask that's constructed properly so it has a high filtration efficiency. And when these masks are made incorrectly, the masks do not filter the air adequately and this allows the virus to spread. So using a bad mask will only give you a sense of false security. It may not protect you, it may not protect the people around you. Secondly, you need to know how to wear it. You need to be sure that the mask is fitting correctly so that the air that you're breathing in and breathing out is filtered properly. And then finally, you need to know how to put it on and take it off without contaminating your face during the process. So with those points in mind, what kind of mask do I really want to use and what am I looking for? Well, ideally, I want to use a commercially made and tested mask, but these are in short supply and often not available. So what I want to do is contact the company, find out how the mask is made. Studies have shown that a minimum of three or four layers of material are necessary to have satisfactory filtration. Now, if cotton is used, a very tight weave, this means it's a high thread count, usually over about 800. And these high thread count cotton materials increase the efficiency of the mask. So if we're talking about a three layer mask, the inner and the outer layers are the high thread count of cotton. And the middle layer should be a reusable filter or silk. In tests, the cotton-silk-cotton combination for masks has been shown to have a very good filtration efficiency. And so we want to look for that. The second thing we want to do is be aware of the fact that masks such as a bandana or just a single layer of a t-shirt have this large open weave in the material and they have a very poor filtration efficiency. In fact, in tests, they're only marginally better than not wearing a mask, so stay away from those. Now, you've heard me talk about this in the past. Remember, the masks that have the exhaust ports fail to filter any air that you breathe out. So if you're using one of these ported masks, and you're an asymptomatic carrier, you're continuing to contaminate the space around you while you're breathing and talking. And while you think you're doing the right thing, you're really not doing anything to stop the spread of the disease. So be sure to avoid these masks. In selecting a mask, you have to have the proper fit, and they come in different sizes. You wanna be sure that the mask fits tightly on your cheeks, uh, under your chin, and over your nose. The best masks have some type of nose wire that can be pinched uh, around the nose, and this cuts down on the leakage of unfiltered air in or out of the mask. So you want to try to get one that fits. I want you to avoid the single layer masks of any type. The bandanas, the scarves, the single layer, uh, the t-shirts that have been cut up, things like that. They just don't work. The filtration efficiency is too low. Next, try to find out how a mask was made because that will tell you whether or not the filtration efficiency is fairly good. And then be aware of the fact that these poorly fitting masks just do not work. If it's too tight when you talk, it will pop up over your chin. If it's too loose, um, then there are too many air gaps around it and you're breathing unfiltered air. And finally, if you're wearing the mask for longer than four hours, you want to change the mask because moisture accumulates on the inside of the mask. And as it accumulates, the mask begins to lose the filtration efficiency. So be sure to swap the mask out if you, if you have to wear it for a long period of time. So remember, if you're going to go to the trouble of using a mask, use one that works to stop the virus spread. Use it correctly and be sure that it fits. Be safe, stay healthy. Thanks for watching. Firearms are part of my daily life. My office is the gun range. When I'm competing, it's in a safe and controlled environment. But out in the real world, I'm vulnerable, just like you. I'm exposed to the same threats, and I abide by the same laws. With US Law Shield, they take care of me. I know I'm protected if I ever need to defend myself, and they educate me on the legal ability to do so. And that's why my everyday carry consists of three critical items. My gun, my phone, and my U.S. Law Shield card. Training gives me peace of mind on the range, and Law Shield, well, they give me peace of mind off the range. I'm Jesse Harrison, world and national champion pistol shooter, and proud member of U.S. Law Shield. Let's get to it. Fan favorite Q and A uh, during this tumultuous time. Mistakes gun owners make during a crisis. These are your questions that come in for two Texas independent program attorneys, uh, Emily Taylor and Richard Hayes. Emily, welcome aboard. Richard, you there? Can you hear us loud and clear? 
Oh, loud and clear, Sam. Good to talk to you. Good. Emily, you ready to rock and roll? Always. By the way, if this was um, the Mary Tyler Moore show, you'd be Mary Richards. He'd be Lou Grant. Just throwing it out there. Talks amongst um, yourselves. That might be a little, a little of an old reference for the two of us, Sam. <laughs> I know. Both your ages combined is mine. Here we go. Um, these are the questions sent in by our viewers and, of course, members of U.S. Law Shield. Richard A., this is a great question, very timely. How far, Emily, can I go to protect my property? Now, we've seen news stories where people like the McCluskeys come out on the lawn. We've seen where people have actually fired into crowds and such. How far? Yeah, so this is something that we've said, I think, on every single webinar, but it bears repeating. The law, nationwide, doesn't matter where you are, the law is always going to favor lives over things. Now, that doesn't mean that there are not states and are not times where you can't protect your property, even though it's property alone. Um, you know, when you live in a state where you can protect property alone, it's still got to be reasonable. It's still got to be immediately necessary. It's still got to be proportionate to the threat that you're encountering. But again, um, and I think that James Reeves and Edwin talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, do you want to be arrested, have your firearms confiscated, go through the legal system a year or two years later, finally gets trial for a jury to tell you, you did good, you protect your property just fine, you're not guilty, or would you rather stay safe, call the police, and you know, keep your family and your lives safe? That's my recommendation as a lawyer who practices in this area of law every single day. But again, um, you know, your Fabergé egg is sitting in the driveway and someone's coming to take it and your state allows you to defend that property, it may be something that you want to do. Um, just make sure that you are reasonable, proportionate, immediately necessary if your state allows for that defensive property alone. Excellent. Let's get to a Richard Hayes independent program attorney also in the great state of Texas. Uh, these are mistakes gun owners make. Questions. Gary L. wrote in, what is the difference between brandishing and drawing from a legal perspective? So you'll hear somebody brandished a weapon and then somebody was able to draw a weapon. Mr. Hayes, what's the difference? So there's a couple of different things at play here. Obviously, it's going to be different in every state. And, they, and we see a lot of different vocabulary, uh, producing a weapon, exhibiting a weapon, brandishing a weapon. And so they, they are all going to mean different things. But on an instinctual level, uh, we have, obviously, the use of force continuum. And we, on this continuum, things start with you know, just being present to making verbal commands to maybe oh, you know, fists, empty fists to... Uh, maybe brandishing, displaying, producing a weapon, maybe lifting your shirt up, to drawing a weapon, to using deadly force, dis, you know, discharging a firearm, using a knife, something that would cause somebody to die. So we have this big spectrum. And just in the big picture of things, clearly a jury is going to look at picking up shirt like, hey, I don't want any trouble, differently than drawing down on someone and saying, you know, stop right there. So as, as a practical matter, you know, these, these acts are not the same. Um, and, and a lot of states treat these, these acts differently. For example, here in Texas, the display of a weapon, so long as your sole intention is to create the apprehension that you will use it if necessary, constitutes a use of force. So it, it doesn't count as deadly force. Now, I spend a lot of my time educating police officers and prosecutors about that. People still get arrested for ag assault with a deadly weapon. So, you know, but there's a lot of states that have that treatment where displaying a weapon, you know, as a warning, constitute something less than deadly force. You got to learn the law in your state. But uh, but a jury, you know, it's clearly not the same as shooting someone. So um, so that that can go that can go far in self-defense situations. The Q&A part of our webinar across America for U.S. Law Shield. Let me get back to Emily. Emily, this is a great question because everyone asks this in one way or another. Adam F. says, can I carry legally with a license during this pandemic and i mean you i was at the airport a guy had a full mask up to almost you know the top of his nose then he had goggles on over his eyes like he was going to vale or beaver creek i couldn't see who this guy is so how does this pandemic and carrying with a license come together 
Yeah, so we have, I think, two issues at play here. One is the mask issue. The other is just some sort of suspension of carry rights because there have been declarations of emergency. As to the mask issue, I know Edwin addressed this and James Reeves, but it bears repeating. Most states do not criminalize the wearing of a medical mask while carrying. Although many states criminalize wearing a mask with the intent to conceal your identity or commit a crime. Um, and some states do, you know, criminalize any concealment of the face while carrying. Um, you know, those are generally um, for our members, you know, you probably already know who you are, um, out way far to the west, out to the northeast. Um, you know, we have all sorts of more restrictive laws where you have to be more careful. Read your law. See what concealment of identity means. All of that. But most states here in Texas, for sure, we have absolutely no issue. Now, the other issue that comes up there is, is the declaration of an emergency suspending carry rights? I don't know of a single state right now that has tried to do that. Many states actually don't allow it at all. So they cannot mess with your carry rights just because there's an emergency going on. Even those states that may allow it, I think New Jersey allows the suspension of carry rights under many, many circumstances. I mean, they barely allow you to have that right at all. Um, but um, I have not heard of any state that even is allowed to do it engaging in it. So for the most part, your carry rights are unaffected because of the pandemic, which is very good news. Emily Taylor, Richard Hayes, both independent program attorneys, experienced professionals, part of the U.S. Law Shield family that you could have access to when you become a member. Because when you become a member, you get the card, special number on the back. It's the attorney answered emergency hotline, answer 24 Seven and the family at U.S. Law Shield is growing now, passing 525,000 members. Mr. Hayes, let me ask you this question. James L. sent in: If I pull my gun because I feel threatened, and then they back off, will I be prosecuted? It's very, very possible, and a lot of people don't think about this whenever they're training. You know, we go to the range, we shoot and practice, but they don't think about. Uh, what happens after I act in a self-defense situation? And w it's two things. One, it's a defense to yourself, your loved ones, your friends, you know, keeping our person safe. But the second part is it's a defense to a criminal charge, self-defense is. So general rule, can't point guns at people, can't shoot people, can't, you know, run people over with your car. That's the general rule. We have this thing in the law, self-defense, it says sometimes this conduct is justified. Now, all that being said, it is not a defense to being prosecuted. Absolutely, could pulling your gun result in you getting arrested put through the system? Yes, we see that all the time. Uh, what you can do, though, to put yourself in a better position is know the laws in your state. You know, if, if I was in that situation where I had to draw my gun and say, hey, get back, stop, threat, stop, what am I doing next? I'm calling 911. You know, I want to be that person running to 911 explaining I was the victim of a crime. I had to defend myself. Next call, I'm going to talk to my lawyer. But yes, Pulling a gun on somebody, pulling a gun on somebody in defense doesn't keep you from getting prosecuted. You absolutely could be arrested. Emily Taylor, independent program attorney, Kathy C. writes, does stand your ground and castle doctrine protect me if I'm threatened by a mob while in my car and vehicle? Yeah, this is one of the most common questions we've gotten recently. So there's two things to keep in mind. The first is, does your state extend Castle Doctrine to the vehicle? Many, many states do. Some states don't. I know for certain that Illinois does not make that extension to the vehicle for Castle Doctrine. So if it does not extend to your vehicle, you can't rely on anything but I'm protecting human life, right? That's got to be your go-to. If you are threatened in such a way, they've got a weapon, they've got something you say, I've got to defend my life, vehicle aside, that's what you've got to fall back on. Now, if you have castle doctrine applied to occupied vehicles in your state, we do in Texas, that's wonderful because you've got something a little bit extra. You've got this presumption of reasonableness when someone tries to make a forceful and unlawful entry into your castle, your occupied castle, which so happens to be your vehicle. We think about this generally as carjacking situations, but we've got this, this new issue coming up of sort of being surrounded and maybe attacked um, in, a, in a riot situation. So um, just someone 
pounding on your vehicle, maybe even surrounding you. You've got to make that distinction if you're in a castle doctrine state between that sort of behavior, which is terrifying, but you should be as restrained as you can to when someone actually attempts forceful and unlawful entry into the vehicle. They've got a two by four, a crowbar, a skateboard, um, maybe a firearm, right? Anything that's going to get them access into your vehicle, a brick in their hands to break out your window, you have a Castle Doctrine situation. If Castle Doctrine applies, and I can tell you specifically for Texas, you've got this presumption of reasonableness, that your belief that deadly force was immediately necessary is presumed reasonable. If that situation exists, it's incredibly, incredibly powerful. So um, the answer to Kathy's question is, depends where you live, Kathy. If you're in Texas, um, look for that forceful and unlawful entry. If you're not in a Castle Doctrine state, it's got to be a life protection, not a vehicle protection. And most importantly, no matter where you live, Emily, whether it's Pennsylvania to Washington State or wherever you're in between, become a member of U.S. Law Shield, uslawshield.com. Let me jump over to uh, Mr. Hayes. And by the way, both independent program attorneys are former prosecutors in Galveston County, one county south of us in Houston. Uh, a lot of times we'll go to the store and you can get practice ammo or you can get personal defense ammo. Uh, Mr. Hayes, Thomas K. wrote in his question, I have self-defense rounds in my firearm. Will that be used against me in court? The short answer is yes. You know, it, anything you do it can be used against you in court. I mean, I per carry self-defense ammunition myself. But I don't want you to worry too much. This isn't going to be the linchpin of the case. No matter what type of ammunition you use, it is going to be paraded in front of a jury like you're some kind of home, you know, psychopathic maniac that's out to kill. No matter what type of ammo you use. If you use target ammunition, they're going to say the word full metal jacket 100 times in front of the jury. Target ammo. If you use hollow point ammunition, they're going to call it cop killer ammunition. No matter what type of ammunition, if you make your own ammo, they're going to say that you're some kind of weapons you know, expert or you know, you're making these rounds to be more lethal. Or if your ammunition has a silly name like zombie or RIP or you know, something like that, they're going to parade it in front of the jury. I don't want you to worry about that. We have seen a lot of these cases go on across the United States. I have not seen a jury's opinion swayed so heavily just because of the ammunition. It's a factor that they're going to be allowed to consider. But I would say use the ammunition that you are comfortable with, that you train with, um, and let your attorney worry about the ammunition choice. And I'll tell you, sometimes the prosecutor isn't even firearm savvy enough to know that it's an issue. So let your attorney worry about it. Are they going to parade it in front of a jury? Maybe. Let your attorney worry about it. Great answer. Independent program attorneys Richard Hayes and Emily Taylor. E Emily, let me go back to you. Scott J. has a great question. Obviously, it's tied into the McCluskey case from St. Louis that we talked about in the previous segment. If protesters approach my house, Scott J. wants to know, what should he do? This is my best advice um, because we are at a time where gun owners make great headlines, right? The media absolutely loves to plaster that face and tell maybe a one-sided story about what happened. And, you know, ultimately, you're going to get a jury who uh, everyone is inundated with news, all of us, all the time. Um, we are, the best thing you can do is keep yourself out of the headlines. And my best advice for that is someone is approaching you, like in the McCluskey situation, stay inside the home. Take a tactical position inside the home. Call 911. Be ready to defend yourself and your family with your Castle Doctrine protections, not without. Because when you step outside of that threshold, in most states, some states include your curtilage, but that's very, very rare. In most states, when you walk outside the house, you pass that threshold, you have lost a critical legal protection. Don't lose it because you want every advantage, particularly right now, particularly if your face is going to be splashed across the headlines. It is more important now than ever. My best advice is you win 
every encounter that you avoid. Love it. Love it. Great advice. Time for one more on our webinar across America. I'm Sam Malone in Houston. Uh, Mr. Hayes, Leonard V. wrote in, if I feel threatened and my weapon is not scaring them off, should the next step be to fire a warning shot? That is a really, really good question, Leonard. All right, so here in Texas, for example, we don't have warning shots. And most states do not have warning shots. And this is how I think about them as far as how they operate under the law. A warning shot is demonstrating two things simultaneously. One, you're using deadly force. The second thing it demonstrates is it's not immediately necessary under the circumstances because you have time to think about pointing it in a safe direction before discharging it. So you're almost handing a prosecutor a silver platter of, hey, look, uh, I use deadly force and it wasn't immediately necessary because I, I got to plan it out. So if you find yourself in that situation where you where display is not enough, unfortunately, there's not a good answer. If, if, if you have to use deadly force, though, use deadly force. If it's immediately necessary and reasonable under the circumstances, stop the threat. Stop the threat. Now, now I'm going to add a little extra to that. Where we see people getting in trouble, and I can see this happening in the Leonard scenario, acting too soon. So acting before the threat becomes imminent and acting too late, acting after the threat has passed. You know, person, you know, let's say you display your gun, they start running away. If you acted then, it would be too late. So it still needs to be immediately necessary under the circumstances. But just generally, warning shots are a very bad idea. Love it. Love it. Richard Hayes, Emily Taylor, independent program attorneys, U.S. Law Shield. They're both in Texas. Emily, thank you for joining us. Appreciate your time and your insight. Thank you, Sam. Richard, same for you. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, Sam. Thank you to all the commenters. <laughs> Got it. Now, listen, uh, all the people who have written in, we try to get to your questions every webisode. Uh, if you missed part of it, don't worry. Watch it again. But more importantly, if you're not a member, what are you waiting for? Go online right now. USLawShield.com. US Law Shield is the leading legal defense for self-defense program in America. Like they say, you defend your life, they'll defend your firearm. It's legal defense for your self-defense. And they are standing by, once you're a member, once you're a member, uh, they're standing by on their attorney answered emergency hotlines 24-7 to answer your emergency situations. Join, become part of the family that's over 525,000 members strong. And before we wrap up, visit the website and take our online survey, uslawshield.com slash web survey. So we can make our webcasts and our webisodes and our national broadcasts even bigger, brighter, bolder, and better. Remember, join now at uslawshield.com. Thank you for watching. In Houston, Texas, I'm Sam Malone. See ya!